One, two, three, four, now she's ready. Now it's time. A Boston girl who knows who crime. She got cash, cash too. But a bitch on it, I'm not blue. She knows I'm there. She knows I'm her. Hi everyone and welcome to Danny After Dark. If you're new here, make sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss a notification or a new episode. Tonight is a one, another one of my true crime book recommendations. I have been reading a ton, a ton of true crime books. I can't emphasize that enough. You guys have been seeing the stack in the back and that's only a fraction of the books I have to go through. I, I have way more. I just can't help it. I'm just a book nerd. And I'm really excited to share another set of five books to you guys that I really recommend. And I have to say tonight, the books that I'm recommending are a bit all over the place in regards to true crime, which is great because I feel like there's going to be something for everybody. So hopefully any of the books that I recommend for you guys, maybe you might purchase yourselves and enjoy. So before we get into that, let's see who's here. James Watson, you are first. Oh gosh, good to see you, hon. Helter Skelter, never heard of it. Hey, Paul. Uh, the Better Paul, good to see you, hon. Let's see, Camillo, welcome. And I know I butcher your name every single time, and I am so, so sorry, hon. But one of these days I'll get it right. It might be like a year from now, but I will get it right eventually. <laughs> uh, let's see. Hey, Steph, good to see you. Hey, Liz. Liz, one of these books, well, you already know um, one of the books that I got because I told you like the day I bought it. Stay tuned because this book is like, I guarantee you're going to be like, um, next time I see you, bring me that book. Mark my word. Hey, Capone, good to see you. What is this? Paul Cast listens to picture books on Audible. Uh, and I feel like that's even being generous, Capone, to be completely honest. But what can I say? So, all right, you guys, just a few housekeeping things to get out of the way. So, again, if you are not subscribed, please subscribe so you don't miss any new videos. Again, I do two lives a week, one a... Usually, like, I cover a true crime solved case, or this week, I'm doing a true crime book recommendations video. And then, as you know, which you guys get very participatory in, which I'm obsessed with, is the true crime and chill. And for that, joining me is Beckham. It's the only time he ever checks out Danny After Dark. It's because he's on it, but it is what it is. Um, other than that, make sure you are following me on Instagram as well as on TikTok. I'm new to TikTok, so again, be patient with me. In regards to Instagram, if you are not following me there, please, please do. It's a great way to interact with me. I'm very active on there, and I will post if there's any true crime breaking news during like the middle of the week. I'll share it there in my Instagram stories. And today there was like, I think like three or four things where I was like, oh my God, I have, I have to post this now. So yeah, which means True Crime and Chill this weekend will be very, very full of stories. So yes, that is that. Uh, let's see. I love when you do the back. Thank you. Thank you. It's honestly like I love covering like the cases because I get to research them, especially when they're audience suggestions. Then I, I hate to say the word audience, but you know, from you guys, it's cool because some of the cases I, I never hear of. So I get to kind of learn as I go. But this is like where I can totally 
totally nerd out with you guys. And yeah, I absolutely love it. And I do have to say, I mentioned this, oh God, probably like a couple, maybe a month ago, a month or two ago. Liz knows because, you know, she's, you know, my friend and lives in this area, but used bookstores. Oh my God. There's a huge one here in the Massachusetts area. It's still a bit of a hike for me. It's in, so if anybody here is in the Massachusetts area, it's in Burlington. It's called the used book superstore. They, I checked it out because Liz recommended it. Oh my God. Their true crime section. Amazing. Amazing. And for quote unquote used books, some of that, like, I'm like, there's no way anybody read this. Or if so, it, it looked, looked like brand new. Most of the books, I think I left with like six books and I paid under $40. And is it two of them in here that I'm recommending? No, just one this time. No, I lied. Two of them, two of them are in this one, but it's amazing. One, because you're supporting local stores, but also you're getting a great deal. You're getting an absolutely great deal. I think one of the books alone that I bought was like, would have been a $35 book. So I'm like six books for about that price. You can't beat it. You can't beat it. When you read as much as I do, it's worth it. And I keep all of my books. I know, I know, I know. I've had some people be like, oh my God, you have so many. You should just sell them back and get credit and buy new. I'm like, no, I'm not. No, 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 no. I have a huge hutch with all of my books. I keep them all. So yeah, book nerd life. It is what it is. <laughs> um, there's Liz now. Danvers or was it Middleton? Liz, I thought it was in Middleton, but wasn't it like the Danvers Middleton line? I think so. But either way, either way, if you're even if you're not in Massachusetts and you guys have used bookstores near you, check them out. There was several Manson related books at the bookstore when I went. I did buy one of them that I will not be recommending. And I will leave it at that because I'm not here to bash books. Like if I buy a book and I read it and I don't like it and I don't want to recommend it to you guys, I'm just not going to, not going to mention it on air. Cause you know, I'm not one to, you know, someone put hard work into it. I don't want to bash it, but yeah, they had a lot of different types of Manson books. Most of them I'd already owned, but yeah. So check it out. You guys, honestly, honestly, do yourselves a favor, especially if you're into reading as many books as, as I am. <laughs> what is Liz Chirpin? Oh, uh, right. The Middleton one was. Yes. Yep. You're right. Paul, you know what book it is. I told you what book it is. And don't you dare, don't you dare type it in the chat because again, I'm not for bashing, but you know which one it is. Cause yeah. I actually called you from the bookstore and I was like, Hey, look what they have. Should I get it? <laughs> so anyway, uh, let's see. Let's see. Renee is saying I have to do audible so I can do two things at once. Spring break painting the guesser. You are one of the most like, oh my God, I admire how much energy you have. If I had 25% of the energy you have, I would be so much more productive in my day. But yeah, that's the good thing with audible. I know Audible's like the thing right now, especially like for people who commute or, you know, kind of are on the go, you can listen to Audible and kind of go through a lot more books. I'm just so old fashioned. I'm so old fashioned. I literally just love to sit and read and like feel it and, you know, just kind of feel the book, go through it. Like, yeah, I'm not an Audible person. I bought one book on Audible and I hated the experience. I hated it. It just, I'm like, no, no. I can't do it. I get too distracted, but it is what it is. Paul, knock it off. So Paul, can you recommend a book for me? Yeah. Don't listen to him. Capone, you're in the right place. Hey, Wolf. Oh God. Oh God. The shorty shave. No. Go over onto the Paul cast and I'll be honest about the Manson books. I'll put it that way. <laughs> I'll put it that way. Um, let's see what well, Steph is saying. Totally gray. I have to read the book. Don't like me. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, it's not my thing, but I have many friends that swear like that's the way they do it and to each their own, but all right. All right. As much as I love chatting with y'all, 
let's get into it. I'm so excited. Like legit, I'm at work and I'm like, I can't wait to do this today. I can't wait to do this tonight. Like I can't wait to go over the books. So one of the first books that I am recommending for tonight, and I actually bought this at CrimeCon and I actually got to meet the author at CrimeCon. So Susan Hendricks and the book is called Down the Hill, My Descent into the Double Murder in Delphi. We have been covering this case on True Crime and Chill. It's the Delphi murders with Abby and Libby. Currently, the case has not been, I don't want to say quote unquote solved. There is a suspect in custody and that trial will be starting hopefully soon. But why I specifically re recommend this book, and I'll read you guys um, a bit of what, of how Susan writes how it is, but not only is it extremely well-researched and well-written, but Susan Hendricks actually formed a relationship with Kelsey um, German, or German Siebert, um, which is one of the victim's sisters. So you get that personal touch and Susan Hendricks like would fly down to where the families were and spend time with them and has formed lasting relationships with them like through this and you you sense that you don't just get the like the feel of oh somebody's just covering this case and writing a book no there's that personal touch to it that hum the best word to describe it is humane and you don't get that with a lot of true crime books to be perfectly honest which is which is okay that is fine as well but this gives you that like you get so much more emotionally invested in this book because of that. So the way Susan starts the book, so just reading you a little bit from the beginning is, on February 13th, 2017, 13-year-old Abigail Williams and her best friend, 14-year-old Liberty Germain, decided to enjoy a day off from school by exploring the popular hiking trails near the Monon High Bridge in Delphi, Indiana. Less than 24 hours later, their bodies were found on the north bank of Deer Creek, about a mile from where they were last seen. The citizens of Delphi were devastated and replaced their porch lights with orange bulbs, vowing to keep them lit until the murders were solved. In the days and weeks that followed, authorities shared a sketch of the suspect, as well as digital remnants of an unsettling encounter with the girls the girls had with the stranger hours before their disappearance, which Libby recorded on her cell phone as it unfolded. Remember, you guys, if you've been following this case, there was the video clip and audio of what they refer to as bridge guy. And you hear him say, down the hill. So despite the release of this evidence, law enforcement remained tight-lipped about the developments in the case and the public grew restless until the long-awaited suspect was finally arrested in October 2022. Again, the crime occurred in 2017, the suspect was not arrested until October 2022. So Susan Hendricks is a longtime news anchor and broadcast journalist, and she was one of the first reporters to cover this case in studio and on location. As the investigation stalled, Hendricks found herself drawn back to the town of Delphi and over the next few years, as I mentioned earlier, and you get that in the book, she built strong relationships with the girls' families. So in Down the Hill, Susan Hendricks chronicles her pursuit of the truth, featuring exclusive insights and interviews with the people at the heart of this story. And she also really digs into this mystery. So again, this is an excellent book. There are a lot of books on the Delphi murders. This, easily one of like, I don't even want to say top five. I'd say like top two. It is really, really worth it. And again, I was very fortunate enough to meet Susan at CrimeCon. So definitely check this out. Again, it is Down the Hill, My Descent into the Double Murder in Delphi by Susan Hendricks. So before I go into the next book, let's see where you guys are in the chat. Delphi is a mess. Yeah, Wolf, this has been one of those cases. And again, for those who you know, aren't familiar with it, when they released, when the authorities released the ske a sketch, the families were in the community. I mean, talk about a community coming together. I mean, this was one of those examples. There were two innocent girls that were murdered and they wanted this solved. And based on where the bridge was, 
there was all this chatter of it has to be somebody local. Like this can't just be nobody just driving through would know where this is. And, you know, people are looking for, you know, the initial sketch. And then years later, they they change the sketch completely. It, it was just there's been so many twists with this case and the families have been I mean, this has been years that they're waiting for justice and for some type of, I hate to use the word closure because it's never closure, but we'll see as this, as this unfolds, but this book is definitely a good place to, to start. If you aren't familiar with the case, or even if you are familiar with it, it just gives you that really personal insight that really no other author on this on this case has you're not going to get that with any other book on delphi so yeah but wolf i absolutely agree with that renee says so many things are coming up with it all the time i'm always hesitant to read something unresolved i hear you i hear you yeah that's one of the things so you know on the side like on the side if you will you know obviously i you know I'm really into researching true crime but on my true crime cases, if you guys notice, I will never do an unsolved case. I just, I have to have the closure. But yeah, I get what you're saying. And this book though, I would, if you were to go outside that comfort zone, it would be that one. But I completely hear you. I completely hear you on that. Yeah, Wolf, yeah, exactly. Exactly. It is. It is. Absolutely. Um, what am I talking about? I read Manson books, which will never be resolved. You know what, Renee? I mean, talk about burying the lead. No kid, no kidding. <laughs> you know what? Any other book going forward that I cover on this show, if it's an unsolved case, you cannot say anything about it because of this comment. That is amazing. That is absolutely amazing. Uh, there were some shady characters surrounding Delphi, not just one dude. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And it goes into that in the book. Um, the good thing about this book, there is another Delphi book that I will be recommending in a, on my next one, um, which this book got further into what happened with the suspect being arrested before being um, published versus the other one was a little bit, it, you'll see when I recommend that for a different reason. But yeah, it does get into that because yeah, there were several other persons of interest that were ruled out, but yet some people in their mind haven't fully ruled them out. And you'll, you know, you'll kind of understand why as, as you research the case or, you know, read any books on it. Wasn't there talk of a cult doing it? Yes. Yes. That is one of the things that the defense is putting out that it is cult related. And yeah. Uh, yes, 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 yes. So Wolf, yep, yeah, you've heard that too. All right. So switching gears. So the second book that I'm recommending and I can't remember how I stumbled across this book. I'm trying to think. I think I heard it on, um, oh gosh, what is the uh, to True Crime podcast? Totally blanking the name. I recommended it in a, in a previous video too. That's funny. But this author was on, I have to look it up right now because it's going to drive me nuts. And it's a podcast, if you guys are not following, you have to, have to, have to. All right, here it is. Yes. True Murder, The Most Shocking Killers, hosted by Dan Zupansky. All right. So I heard about this book on there. And that podcast is great because if you are into true crime books, every single episode is an author with a true crime book. And I listen to every single episode. You know, some of them interesting episodes, but it doesn't compel me to like immediately go online and buy the book. This one, however, it did. 
So it's The Devil's Defender, My Odyssey Through American Criminal Justice from Ted Bundy to the, and I'm totally going to butcher this, The Kandahar Massacre by John Henry Brown. So for those who are not familiar with him, this book gives such an insight that I didn't know. I did not know. And I'm very well researched in the Ted Bundy case. That was one of the ones that got me into true crime in regards to like, how the criminal mind works, but more so how society reacts to acts to serial killers. In this book, touches on both. It touches upon Ted Bundy as well as touches upon society in regards to this lawyer's journey through that. So in the briefest of nutshells, so John was assigned early on to work with Ted Bundy and he talks about in, oh God, there's one of the pages that Oh, I should have bookmarked it. But one thing that has always stuck with him in regards to working with Ted is over the years, Ted would make comments to him in regards to we're similar and, and things like that. And it always stuck with him and it always kind of freaked him out under, I mean, understandably. And the thing with this is when you represent somebody who's so high profile, whether it's a, a Ted Bundy, a Richard Ramirez, a John Wayne Gacy, like those type of criminals, not only are you working with them, but you are in the forefront, you're in the public, you are judged, you are scrutinized for better or for worse. And the thing is, he doesn't spare any details of his journey with working with Ted Bundy. So he gives it twofold. He does it with information, you know, conversations that he had with Ted, things that Ted shared with him. Some of the comments that he goes, they're just bone chilling, absolutely bone chilling. But he also goes through his struggle with kind of going through this and again, dealing with the scrutiny of representing Ted Bundy. And even for those of you who know the Ted Bundy case, when Ted, you know, trapped, you know, he escaped from jail twice and ended up in Florida for the Coyote, and then he was um, tried for the Kai Omega murders and for Kimberly Leach. He, Ted still reached out to John Henry Brown. And he talks about that in here. Ted just didn't let him go. And there was still that, unsettling relationship, if you will. And it's very interesting to hear it from John's perspective. And John talks about, you know, over the years, his struggles in regards to, you know, substance abuse and things like that at, you know, failed relationships, which is not uncommon. If you read other books from other, you know, criminal lawyers or, you know, detectives who work like these hard, hard, grueling cases, that's very common. Very, very common. You know, your family life, your personal life suffers because you're essentially so invested and almost married to your job in a sense. But this gives a great insight. So if you, again, are familiar with the Ted Bundy case, this is a top read because it, again, gives you an insight you're not going to get from any other book. You're going to hear it from the attorney's mouth himself. Or if you're new to the case, this gives you a good insight in regards to kind of a behind the scenes because there's so many, so many books covering Ted Bundy, right? We all know that. But this, again, will give you a different type of perspective and I think it's one that's really worthwhile. And the thing with this attorney as well, he covered other, other very well-known cases like the Wami massacre. And he discusses that in his book. One of the other um, books, uh, sorry, one of the other cases that he covered was um, Benjamin, and I, I always butcher his last name, um, Benjamin Nick. Um, NG or Benjamin Nye, I, my apologies if I'm butchering the last name, but he talks about that as well. So again, very, 
very high profile cases as well. He covered a lot in his career. A must read, a must read. So again, this book is The Devil's Defender, My Odyssey Through American Criminal Justice from Ted Bundy to the Kandahar Massacre by John Henry Brown. So a few new people in the chat. Let's see, Dancing Firefly, hello, welcome. Little Milky, good to see you. Uh, what book have you been reading? I've been reading Blood on the River. And I'm totally going to butcher that name, so I'm going to say it. So many scenes I want to see. Oh, I'm not familiar with that book. Not familiar with that. Um, okay. Okay, you guys are totally... I love that you guys are interacting with this. This is awesome. That book sounds great, Danny. I'd recommend it. <laughs> so, the next book... And this is one of the ones I got from, as I mentioned earlier, that used book superstore. And this is one, Liz, if you're still listening, this is the one. Right when I bought it, I, I texted her a picture. And I'm like, and she, I think she already said, like, I need that. I want to borrow it. This book, and I, I'm calling it a true crime book, but it could go, it could go other ways too, is The Poisoner's Handbook by Deborah Bloom. So this is Murder and the Birth of Forensic Medicine in Jazz Age, New York. So I pause for a few different re reasons and I'll explain. So the reason for my pause with this is this is very science heavy in regards to a lot of the different um, kind of quote unquote poisons that that they're discussing. And when I say poison, a lot of these things back then were so easily accessible to the public and so hard to detect. So a lot of these crimes went unnoticed. And it wasn't until decades later, you know, now, you know, when I read, I'll read you guys some of the poisons that, you know, back then were so hard to detect and just Again, so readily available. You'll hear that now and you're like, well, obviously, you know, we live in such a different world. But back then, not only through each um, poison do they describe, like they describe it like element wise, they break it down. So again, if you're a sciencey person, you're going to love this book. Absolutely love it. But they also discuss within each one, several cases where, again, we're going back decades that it was uh, suspected, but when undiagnosed or where detectives were working and it was kind of now becoming something that was on the radar, but maybe they didn't have tests for it versus moving forward. And now there are some tests for it. Sometimes bodies had to be exhumed and they do discuss that too. So it's very interesting because you see the evolution that a lot of these, um, and I know different states use different words, whether it's, um, you know, a medical examiner, um, somebody who does the autopsies. The, again, there's different words in different states that describe it and require different either licensing or sometimes you don't even have to be an MD. That is interesting in itself. But yeah, and it, you read this and you get an appreciation for how things were solved back then once they were able to kind of get a little bit of a grasp on it. We take so much for granted now, the where we are in regards to now there's tests that quickly can pick up, pick up if any of these are detected when somebody's either sick or have already passed away. So yeah, it really gives you that evolution. But just so you have an idea of some of the um, poisons that they discuss in here, chloroform, wood alcohol, different types of cyanides, arsenic, mercury, carbon monoxide, methyl alcohol, radium, ethyl alcohol. Um, there's another chapter on carbon monoxide and both of them are very interesting in itself, but I don't want to spoil it. Um, thallium. So those are the ones that it discusses here. And there was a book that I actually 
borrowed from Liz, um, the Radium Girls, and I recommended that several videos ago. It does get into that a little bit under the Radium section. So since I was already familiar with it because of that book I previously read, I was able to kind of pick it up rather quickly here, but it just went into the briefest of nutshells. So this is a really great book. It's much older. It's not new. Um, when is the date that it was published? 2010. Yeah, 2010. So yeah, it's about 13, 14 years old, but still such a great read. And I would absolutely recommend it. And if traditional kind of quote unquote true crime isn't your thing, but you're into, you know, the more science background, you'd still love this book. So that's why I recommend it. So again, it is The Poisoner's Handbook by Deborah Bloom, Murder and the Birth of Forensic Medicine in Jazz Age, New York. So check that out. Yeah. I <laughs> see, I already knew. I already knew. Um Danny after dark, that last name is pronounced Ng. Oh, I know that. Oh, I know that. I knew I I knew I was gonna butcher it. But thank you, Capone. Is there, is it ever a Danny After Dark episode if I don't butcher like 20 words at least and names, unfortunately? Um, do the man, how Danny from do the man pronounce do da, love your work. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Welcome. Good to see you here. Hopefully you find a book in here that I'm recommending that you like. If not, just hang out and have fun in the chat. Uh, let's see. Officially, oh, geez. <laughs> James, you are nothing if not consistent. Um, let's see. All right. Yes. Yeah, so Capone was talking about a book that he's reading. The Interesting. Okay. I don't know much about that. Let me know once you are done with it, if you recommend it. Hi, Eric. Good to see you. I hope you're doing well. Okay. So the next book that I am recommending in my true crime book recommendations is, and I'm a Boston girl. So when I saw this, I was like, all right, all right. Unnecessary roughness inside the trial and final days of Aaron Hernandez. And this is by Jose Baez, who represented him not in his original trial, but his later trial right before Aaron had took his own life. And this book has a foreword written by Shiana Jenkins Hernandez, which as we know was um, Aaron's fiance. So this book gives a different angle because again, we, we know the crimes that were committed. Jose is coming in again at the point where the first, first trial already happened. He was found guilty. So now he's working to kind of obviously put doubt, um, reasonable doubt in there and to ideally get the sentences over, you know, overturned or get him a new trial. So Jose Baez talks about, you know, obviously the flaws or things that maybe um, Aaron's previous defense kind of either overlooked, missed, flat out dropped the ball with. We see that all the time when, you know, covering these cases, right? But Jose also gives his very personal relationship that he developed with Aaron. And it's interesting because at times in the book, Jose even says statements like, you know, I, I came to view Aaron as a good, like a close friend or a good friend. And reading it, it was, I was almost taken aback. So I was like, I, I understand, you know, you're working with somebody, but I, I, I don't know. I'm a very, you know, professional boundaries. There's a wall type of thing. You know, you can't get too close to your clients and this, you, there's clearly a, a much deeper relationship, which to each their own. Some people might read that and appreciate that about this book, but for me, it was just a, Again, I'm, I'm just kind of a, all right, keep the boundaries, but that didn't happen in this case. So 
Um, one of the things that I will read to you guys is a bit of how Jose recommend, you know, has he described his book. And if you're thinking, how do I know the name Jose Baez? I will tell you right after, because that was one of the things when I was reading this, I'm like, I know this name. I know this attorney. This is a well-known attorney. What case was it? What case was it? But I'm going to leave you in suspense until after I read the description of this book, because I'm just mean. So this book is the revelatory inside story of the trial and final days of New England Patriots superstar Aaron Hernandez by his attorney and best-selling author, Jose Baez. When renowned defense attorney Jose Baez received a request for representation from Aaron Hernandez, the disgraced Patriots tight end, he was already serving a life sentence for the murder. Defending him in a second double murder trial seemed like a lost cause, but Baez accepted the challenge and their partnership cultivated in a dramatic courtroom victory, a race to contest his first conviction and ultimately a tragedy when Hernandez took his own life days after his acquittal. This riveting, closely observed account of Hernandez's life and final years, the only book based on countless intimate conversations with Hernandez and told from the perspective of a true insider. Written in support with the support of Hernandez's fiance, again, Cheyenne and Jenkins. This is the uh, it takes readers inside the high profile trial, offering a dramatic retelling of the race to obtain key evidence that would exonerate Hernandez and later play a critical role in appealing his first conviction. With revelations about his client's personal life that weren't shared at trial and exploration of the stun uh, stunning chronic traumatic and so, oh my gosh, I know how to say this word. I'm going to totally butcher it. Encephalop encephalopathy um, diagnosis revealed by his autopsy. So um, CTE. Jose Baez's um, book is a startling courtroom drama with an unexpected portrait of a fallen father, fiance, and teammate. Think about that last line that I just read. It paints Aaron Hernandez in a very different light than how we came to know him at the end. So the thing with this book is, again, it also, as I mentioned, it brings you through Jose critiquing the original trial, working with him kind of leading up to the acquittal. He discusses everything leading up to Hernandez's suicide, where he was, what happened, how he immediately got in touch with um, China Jenkins, in the family and the whole whole drama with the family that in itself is a is a crazy story too but also the fight for the cte scan to be done there was all this fight about you know aaron's body and his brain in regards to scanning for cte and jose Baez kind of questioning you know once it was revealed that hernandez had such brain damage you know obviously from from playing football for so long and from such an early age you know, Jose's questioning, did I miss things? Could things have turned out differently had we done tests while he was alive? But as we know, that's not that simple in regards to CTE. So you get that. All right. I left you guys hanging. Where do you guys know Jose Baez from? He represented Casey Anthony. And he also wrote a book on that, which I purchased and have yet to read. And I'm very excited to do that. So yeah, as soon as I made the connection, I was like, oh my God, he represented Casey Anthony. And I Googled it and yep, there was a book. I'm like, add to cart, check out. I mean, I bought that within seconds. So I do recommend this book. Again, I'm from Massachusetts. The Patriots are our home football team. And we all here remember everything that happened when Aaron Hernandez was suspected of the crimes, when he was arrested, when he went through the trial, when it was appealed, when it was essentially, you know, acquitted, and then when he took his life. So it was interesting to kind of reread that and kind of take, took me back to like when the crimes happened, like, oh, I remember when that happened. And it kind of fills in details either for things that I have forgotten because it's been so many years or things that I just didn't realize along the way and may have overlooked as the case was going on. So I do recommend this book. Again, it is Unnecessary Roughness by Jose Baez. 
inside the trial and final days of Aaron Hernandez. And it has a foreword by Shiana Jenkins Hernandez, who was um, Aaron's fiance. So check that out. So let's see where you guys are with the chats. Oh, Lil Milky, okay, is describing the book that he's reading. Is it Baez or Byers? Oh, Jose Baez. Let me put that in the chat um, if I'm understanding your question correctly. I know you asked it a few minutes ago. Um, let's see, Kathy. Hello, welcome. Um, let's see, Greg, bye. Hi, welcome, good to see you. Um, let's see, you have both versions of Flowers in the Attic on DVD. Okay, okay, you guys are talking about Andrew Books. I'm loving all of the book conversation, even if it's one that um, I'm not familiar with, but you guys are chatting about here. Love it, love it, love it. Okay. All right, so the last book tonight to recommend to you guys. This book was a gift. It was a birthday gift from Mr. Beckham and Shelly when they came to visit. So we were at a store and I walked by it and I was like, oh my God, this, this is one of the brand new Harold Schechter books. And I, I didn't get it, but they kind of like made me go away from them. And then later, uh, Beckham and Shelly were like, here you go. Happy early birthday. And I was, oh my God. So thank you, Mr. Beckham and Shelly for this book. So I've mentioned Harold Schechter to you guys once, twice, maybe 500 times. I own all of his books. Phenomenal true crime historian author. That is the best way to describe him. This is his most recent book. For those of you who don't know, Murder Berlia, A History of Crime in 100 Objects, again, by Harold Schechter. So this book, and I will kind of flip through some of the pages so you guys have an idea of the setup. This is honestly a great book if you're into kind of quick reads about so many different types of crime cases, some solved, maybe some unsolved and some well-known cases and a lot of other cases that you've never heard of. There were so many in here that I had never heard of. And Harold's done several interviews about this book. And that's what he strived for. Some of the items in here, again, you're going to be like, oh, okay, for example, something maybe relating to John Wayne Gacy or Jeffrey Dahmer. You're like, okay, well, I'm familiar with those. But he doesn't do that a ton in this book. He kind of sprinkles them in and gives a lot of other objects that you might not be aware of. So again, and there is over a hundred in this book. So you get essentially, you know, a hundred different small true crime cases in this one book, which is amazing. So let me describe to you this book as Harold describes it on the back. So Feed your morbid curiosity with stories of 100 objects connected with some of the most gruesome murders ever committed. And don't feel sheepish about it. Until the police started roping off crime seeds, hordes of onlookers would walk through grabbing any kind of souvenir they could. Murder relics possess an unusual and sinister power. It can be something as obvious as um, the lugar used by Harold Unruh, the father of mass murder, or a seemingly innocuous crucifix belonging to Augusta Gine who railed against sin and was the mother of real life monster, Ed Gein, whose crimes inspired Psycho, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and Silence of the Lambs. Using one significant object per spectacular crime as a way to retell its chilling story, no gory details spared. Murderabilia weaves a historic tapestry of 100 unthinkable spasms of depravity and violence that have captivated readers for hundreds of years and continue to hold us spellbound. That is spot on to this book. And one of the things that Harold has discussed, if you are familiar with his body of work, or if you've maybe heard any interviews of him talking about this book, the concept of murderabilia, if you will, 
it's nothing new. Again, as he just described, this goes back not just, you know, in the last maybe 20, 30 years, you know, with the internet, you know, going that you can find that stuff on the dark web if, if that's your thing. But this goes back decades, decades, even centuries of people being into that. And he's really good at kind of describing, you know, what is the fascination with that? But again, a lot of these cases are necessarily an object, some that you might not have ever heard of. And some of the items he actually personally owns in regards to how he gets that or how he obtained them, I should say, he goes into that in this book too. But it's so well written. And again, with Harold Schechter, he's not necessarily just a true crime author. He really is a true crime historian. All of, all of his books, you get that feel. It's not just all the gore. He really researches the community and the, the people there, the layout of the land and everything associated with that. The crime is just one of the things that he talks about. In this, because you know, he's trying to cover a lot in one, as he says, he doesn't spare the, you know, the gory details are there but also a little bit of the background, which is appreciated. So, you know, for I'm just gonna, you know, kind of quickly skim through here. As you can see, like maybe one case is covered in like four pages. Um, I'm trying to think, like Bell Guinness's false teeth is one of the examples. Um, Henry um, Landrieu's Oven, The Blue Beard of Paris. That's one case if you guys haven't heard of. Check that out. That is interesting. Um, a page from Carl Pandram's Handwritten Confession. So again, there's photographs of all of the items that he describes. And it's really cool because some of them are covered, like this one, Al Capone's Rap Sheet. It's just covered on two pages, but there's a lot to it. Um, Bonnie and Clyde, Death Car. I mean, as I'm scrolling through this right now, I'm like, oh, I want to read it again. But it's a great, great book. With Harold Schechter's books, again, he's written so many. I own all of them. I can't recommend his body of work enough. But if you were to pick up one and you're like, well, where do I begin? I would say this because, again, there's a hundred over a hundred cases or a hundred objects in here. So you're going to get a feel for a lot of different crimes and you're going to maybe find one that is of interest to you that you're like, gee, I haven't heard of that. You know, that necessarily that crime before I want to research that a bit more or so on and so forth. So yeah, for right now, I would say if you're going to pick up one Harold Schechter book, this is it. This is it. So again, this is Murderabilia, A History of Crime in 100 Objects by Harold Schechter. And thank you again to Mr. Beckham and Shelly for getting me this for my birthday. Love it. What better gift than the gift of a true crime book? <laughs> so brain damage and crime. Oh, come on now. Oh my God, that's so funny, Capone depravity and violence. Uh, let's see. Renee says, I think my next book is the art thief. It's true crime of an art thief combines both things. I like it. That is cool. Did Beckham write anything in the book? No, I would. I would be so mad if he did. I keep my books in pristine, pristine condition. Like, you know how there are some people that as they're reading the book, they kind of maybe instead of using a bookmark, they'll like fold the top of the page, just like the corner in. No, no, never in any of my books. Like, no, 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 never. Um, I don't mark them up. I don't, oh, they are in pristine condition. So if he wrote in it, I'd be like, I mean, I'd be like, no, what did you do that? But no, he didn't. I think he knew better than to do that. So yeah, those are the five books that I recommend right now for my true crime book recommendations. And if you, I'll hang around for a little bit more if you guys have any questions or comments on that. And 
Most importantly, if you guys have any true crime book recommendations for me, please, please share. Either leave it in the chat here as we're live, or if you're catching this later on, leave a comment on the video. There have been so many true crime books that I have picked up because of your suggestions. Some that I either have heard of that I'm like, oh, well, I just never got around to reading it and then picked it up, or some that I just never heard of, never knew the cases, and then you got, you know, going on your recommendations, and then purchase those books. So yeah, I loved sharing, sharing the idea of a really good book. So hence why I do these videos, and hence why when you guys make a suggestion, I thoroughly, thoroughly check out the books that you guys recommend. So absolutely love it. Capone is saying, not really true crime, but I'm reading Stone by Andrew. See, I'm going to totally, um, Andrew Luke Oldham, about how he got screwed out of the Rolling Stones after basically creating them and marrying Faithful. Gotcha. Do you keep track of your reads in Goodreads? I do not. No. Nope. So... Yeah, other than that, that is all I have for that. And if any of these books that I covered tonight, or if there's any that I covered in previous true crime book recommendations videos that you want a full episode on, more of a deep dive, please don't hesitate to request that. Leave it in the, again, leave it in the chat live, or as, you know, if you're catching this after, just leave it in the comments and I will be more than happy to do so. After last time I did a true crime book recommendations video, there was a few messages I got from some of the recent books that I covered, or even some going back to like, I think one of the very first ones I did like, what, a year and a half ago, um, asking, hey, can you cover in depth that book? So I'm all for it. So I have a stack going of ones that you guys want a deep dive on. So I'd be more than happy to do that. So just let me know. Uh, let's see. Oh, no, thank you. Thank you for hanging out and listening to, yeah, the books that I've just been really busy reading and nerding out over. <laughs> um, let's see. Hello, Jeffrey. Uh, David Frazier's Murder Cases and McDade's Annals of Murder are two books you should pick up. Amazing um, bibliographies that will lead to all kinds of things you never heard. Thank you for that. I will be checking that out after tonight's show, I assure you. Thank you. Hi, Chris James. Yes, you are coming in like literally at the very end, but that is okay. You can go back and check it out after. Andrew. Yeah, you guys have been like chatting about a few different authors in here back and forth that you guys seem to really dig, which is awesome. So, all right, guys and gals, that is it for tonight. So thank you for sticking around for another episode of Danny After Dark. And again, for just indulging the part of me that just loves to read and listening to my current true crime book recommendations video. So later on this week, there will be a true crime and chill. Again, there's already a lot going on this week in regards to true crime. So it will be a jam packed episode, I assure you. So I will see you then. But until next time, always remember, we don't live in darkness. Darkness lives in us. Bye, everyone.